Okay. I like the idea that you're going to watch this over and over and over again. I mean, I, I don't think it's going to get any better. <laughs> so, we're talking about the book of Job today. I don't know, I mean, the one line that we're going to, that's the hook, it's at the end of the book, the one line that allows us to put it in the category of misunderstood texts <clears throat> is the line where Job says he despises himself and he's sorry. So, when we get there, you'll see that's not what he says. But I want to talk about the book in general, because the book of Job is the most honest book in the entire Bible. Now that's not just my opinion, it's my opinion. <laughs> right. I think it's the most honest book in the entire Bible, and we'll, we'll see why. Last week we talked about the Ten Commandments. It was a lot of material to take in, and then we cut the class short so that people could see an actual Torah. It, was anybody completely lost by, by last week? I tried to make this case that the Ten Commandments that we imagine were given by God on the tablets were, in fact, just by looking at the text itself, no midrash, no rabbinic interpretation, just by looking at the, the Bible itself, the Bible makes it clear that those aren't the Ten Commandments. If you were lost last week, all you have to do is watch that tape over and over <laughs> and over again, and eventually it'll make sense and you'll be convinced. All right, well, let's talk about Job, and the best way to talk about Job is to talk about Deuteronomy. <laughs> so if you're following along in Bible, in your Bibles, turn to Deuteronomy chapter 11, verse 13 and following. So Deuteronomy chapter 11, we'll start with verse 13, we'll read a couple of verses here. What you have in the book of Deuteronomy, the book of Deuteronomy was discovered long after the other, the first four books of the Bible. So as far as the Jews knew, there were the four books of Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Okay, good. So you got the list, right? Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers. That's what they thought the Bible was, the Torah was. Then, one day, while cleaning out a closet in the temple, somebody found the missing fifth book of Moses, the book of Deuteronomy. The book of Deuteronomy, the idea behind it is this is Moses' farewell speech. He's dying. He, uh, or, or actually, he's not dying, he's going to die. Right? There's nothing wrong with Moses, except that when he was supposed to talk to a rock and have it bring forth water, he got ticked off and he hit the rock twice with his staff to bring forth water. And God said, basically, if you can't control your temper, you can't go into the promised land. He was the only person in all of history who was ever denied an entry into that land because they couldn't control their temper. If you read the news, nobody controls their temper there. It's just the opposite. It's so hot and everyone just gets nuts. But anyway, he couldn't go in. So, so, so he was 120 years old. There's nothing wrong with him. He, he invested in long-term you know, insurance, medical insurance, but he's never going to use that because he never had a problem. But because the, the people are going in, and he's not allowed in, God's going to kill him. And so he get, but God allows him to give his final speech. And you have to figure, the book is so long because he's going, wait, I don't want to die yet. <laughs> so let me, let me tell you some other stuff I remember from our history. And he sort of recounts the, the history of, of the Jews up to that point. And in the text, he lays out 
what's called the if-then theology of classical Judaism. If-then. If you do X, God will do Y. Right? And, and here it is. Chapter 11, verse 13. If, <coughs> if you obey the commandments that I enjoin upon you this day, loving the Lord your God and serving him with all your heart and soul, I will grant the rain for your land in season, the early rain and the late. You will gather in your new grain and wine and oil. I will also provide grass for the fields of, for your, in the fields for your cattle, and thus you shall eat your fill. Take care not to be lured away to serve other gods and bow to them, for the Lord's anger will flare up against you and... If you do the wrong thing, he will shut up the sky so there'll be no rain and the ground will not yield its produce and you will soon perish from the good land that the Lord is assigning you. That's classic biblical theology. You do what God says, God gives you a reward. I mean, it's not different than basic parenting, right? Unless you've read Parent Effectiveness Training, when it's all about, oh, you're unhappy. You know, the, <coughs> <coughs> the kid wants candy and you're not letting the kid have candy. You go, oh, I see, you're really unhappy because you don't have candy. It's like commiserating, but you never actually solve the kid's problem, which is why they go to therapy later. <laughs> but here it's really clear. You do X and I'm going to give you Y. You don't do X, and I'm going to give you Z. Y is good, Z is bad. And it lays it right out there. The problem with this kind of theology is it is testable. Right? A lot of theological things are not testable. If you believe that if you live a certain way, you're going to go to heaven, when you test that theology, you're dead. So you may be right, you may be wrong, but the rest of us have no idea. No, we don't know. When I was just out of rabbinical school, I had my first, I don't know, my first encounter maybe with a, a congregant who was dying was this 16-year-old boy. And it's a long story, which I won't go into, but he was, we were in his hospital room, he was unconscious, I was with his mom, his dad, and his social worker, and he was going to die any second. And he hadn't been, he hadn't been able to communicate in a while, and he, he was for hours unconscious. And then all of a sudden, he comes to. He comes back into normal consciousness, maybe normal in quotes, and he sits up in bed, and he has this beatific smile on his face, and he looks at his mom and his dad and the social worker and me. <coughs> Excuse me. And he says, I found it. And then he dies. At which point I leap on the kid's bed, grab him by the shoulders, shake him up and down. What did you find? What did you find? I didn't do that. I thought about doing that, but I think there's probably a law against it. So... I don't know what he found, but he found something. Last night uh, on my, my podcast, I have two podcasts. This was the Essential Conversations podcast. I interviewed this woman, Dr. Sharon Prentice, and her, uh, her, her latest book, maybe it's her only book, is called Into the Starlight, I think, something like that. And it's about what's called shared death experience. So near-death experience is when you're dying, but you don't actually die, but you're, you seem to be dying or seem to be even dead on an operating table, and you have this experience of rising above your body. You can see yourself on the bed or on the table. You see the doctors around you and the nurses, but you're moving up. You can hear what they're saying, but you move out of the hospital space into this tunnel, and at the end of the tunnel there's a light, and you're drawn toward the light, and sometimes there's people on the sidelines you know, wishing you well, and, and you're moving toward the light. And then if you were actually going to die, the, the assumption is you would move into that light, and then you're gone. 
But in a near-death experience, you draw close to the light, and then a voice from the light says, it's not your time, and then you find yourself back in the body, hoping your insurance covers whatever it is you're there for. <laughs> Shared death experience is when you're with, and you don't even actually have to be with the person, Sharon told me. It's when a person, a loved one dies, and they go through this tunnel thing, and you're tagging along for the ride. Now, she had two deaths in her family. She had a, a young daughter who died very, very young. You know, she was a toddler. And then her husband. When her daughter died, nothing happened. But when her husband died, she had this experience. She was with him in the tunnel. Now, she heard nothing. She just, he passed, and, and that was it. And she came back. But her understanding of it is, is that he went somewhere. He, she saw him in the starlight. Uh, he, he died, he was a 200 pound man who died weighing only 90. But in the starlight, he was back to 200 again. Personally, I hope to lose weight in the process, <laughs> but that's just me. Anyway, she believed that he was passing over into another realm where he would be healthy and happy, and, and she would see him in, in the future when she died. That's the assumption many near-death experiencers share, and that's the assumption that many shared death experiencers believe in. You can't really test that. Even if you buy the experience, and I don't doubt, I've done a lot of research on this, I don't doubt the experience. I I doubt, maybe that's too strong, there's no way to prove the assumptions that people who have the experience make, that that means you live on in another realm. There's no way to know that. No one's actually died. Near death is one thing, but dead dead is something else. No one's actually died and come back to say this is what it's like. So you can't test that. The theology in the Bible, because they don't have a real afterlife scenario in the Bible, they believe in this place called Sheol. Sheol is where everybody goes. Humans and animals, good people, bad people, everyone goes to Sheol, and they wait there until the resurrection. Sheol is just, it's this gray place. It's the best, the best example, the best description of it I can think of is Sheol is like Motel 6, but they don't leave the light on for you. <laughs> but you can't prove that either. But there, in the Bible, they're not really concerned with, in, in the Hebrew Bible, sorry, be clear. In the Jewish scripture, in the Hebrew Bible, they're not concerned with the afterlife. They're concerned with this life. That's, that's what really matters to them. So they have a this-worldly theology. And the reward for doing what God says is in a place in heaven, because they don't have that in their, in, in their uh, it's not a concept they entertain. If you do what God says, 1113, if you obey the commandments I enjoin upon you this day, which is loving God and serving God, what do you get? I mean, you can imagine Somebody, you know, Moses saying, well, tell them, Don, what they've won. Right? You know, Don Pardo, remember Don Pardo? Yeah, you're old enough to remember Don Pardo, or you're so old you no longer remember him, but you did once. <laughs> so what do you win? You win rain in, the, in its proper season, and there's two growing seasons, so uh, early and late. You gather lots of grain, wine and oil, not only do you have grain to eat, but the grasses in the fields are abundant, so your cattle grow fat. And if you have fat cows, you have healthy people. That's sort of the idea, because you can eat the cows, and you eat the grain, and you drink the wine, and everything's great. That's what you get. The problem of this kind of theology is it's testable. If I'm doing everything God said, and I don't get fat cows, Something is wrong. And now there's only two ways to deal with what's wrong. Either God is BSing me here in Deuteronomy, or Moses is. 
either theology is wrong or I'm not really doing what God wants. Those are my only two options. If the reward for doing what God wants is fat cows, and, and elsewhere there's other versions of this, you have lots of children, you have, you know, you're wealthy and healthy and all that. If that's the reward and I'm not getting it, either the system is false or I'm really not doing what God wants, even though I thought I was. The book of Job is an attack on this theology. It's a direct attack on this theology. The book of Job is written centuries after Deuteronomy. And by the time you get to the, <clears throat> the time frame of the book of Job, like second century, by the time you get to the book of Job, people are questioning this theology. And the way Jews argue about these things is they write books. That, that's what Jews do, we write books. Ecclesiastes says, to the writing of books there is no end. Well, that's Jewish, right? If, you know, if we don't agree, we write a book that's anti. If we do agree, we write a book in support. But we're always writing books. <clears throat> Jews in the United States are, in the last study I read, Jews, American Jews, buy more books than any other ethnic group in the United States. Doesn't mean we read them, <laughs> but we buy them. And we tend to buy lots of books about ourselves. <laughs> so that's why I... You know, I can put food on the table because I, <coughs> I write these books and there's enough Jews to read them that my wife and I can eat. Mm. Enough Jews to buy them. I don't really care if you read them. Okay, but that's the, that's the, the, the context here. We know the classic theology and then we get the book of Job. So you can turn to the book of Job. Boy, I apologize for the choking, which is going on for weeks now. <coughs> so, <clears throat> first thing I want you to notice in the book of Job, everybody find it? First thing I want you to notice is there's two different styles of writing in the book. Prose and poetry. And almost every Bible regardless of the language, makes this clear. So if you're opening Job 1, you'll see it's just like other prose passages of the Bible, chapter 1, chapter 2. It's just paragraphs. But when you get to, paragraph, when you get to chapter 3, it's verse. You know, like poem, poetry verse. You see that? I mean, is there any Bible in the room that doesn't actually make the distinction? block text and then, you know, poet, poetically printed out text. It picks up, and, and from, from chapter 3 all the way to the end of the book, it's poetry. Until you get to the last section, which is chapter 42, which starts out as poetry, and then with verse 7 to the end of the book, verse 17, the next 10 verses, it's back to prose again. So why does this matter? The prose part of Job <clears throat> is the older material. The verse part comes a little later. We don't know when the older part was written. The theory is, and, and it's well documented in academic circles, but the theory is that there was a folk tale <clears throat> that is written in the prose that some philosopher poet took, cut in half, separated the, the, the parts, and wrote a poem in between. And the poem challenges the fundamental theology of the time that we read in Deuteronomy. So let's, let's start with 
the prose, the older part. So here's the story. You can probably know the story, but here's the story. <clears throat> There's this guy named Job. It tells you right in line one. There was a man in the land of Uz named Job. It sounds like it's going to be one of those, you know, um, lyric, uh, um, limericks, right? There was a man from Uz named Job who had, a, you know, something. <clears throat> but he was blameless and upright. He feared God and shunned evil. Seven sons and three daughters were born to him. His possessions were 7,000 sheep and 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen and 500 she-asses, and a very large household. That man was wealthier than anyone in the East. So this is a very well-to-do guy. <clears throat> Why? Because he was a good guy. He feared God and shunned evil. Right? He did what God wanted and therefore was rewarded. <laughs> then you get this next section. Um, well, th l one more thing about Job. So, he himself was upright and blameless, but he worried about his kids. So, not that there's anything wrong with his kids. We don't learn anything that says they were not upright and blameless. But just to be on the safe side, Job offers more sacrifices to God in the name of his kids so that if the kids did do something less upright than Job's uprightness, God would be placated because God got, you know, a sacrifice from Job and it was, okay. So Job is, is not only, not only takes care of himself, he takes care of his, his family. He's got seven sons and three daughters. None of them are named. It's interesting, though, what happens at the end regarding names. Now we switch scenes. The scene is... <laughs> it's always that phone. We won't, we won't ask you to reveal yourself, but <clears throat> that is not being upright and, <laughs> and blameless. <coughs> Okay, so <coughs> every, <clears throat> God holds like a, a twice annual meeting of all the angels. And <clears throat> you know, it's their, it's their annual board meeting. They come to Opryland, I don't know where they go. But they, they have this meeting, and at the meeting, God singles out his chief prosecuting attorney, who, in, in, which in Hebrew is called Satan, and in English we call Satan, right? Satan. And remember that from uh, Saturday Night Live? Yeah, the church lady. So Satan in the Hebrew Bible is not the bad guy. Satan in the Hebrew Bible has no power. Later, you know, Jesus gets you know, get thee behind me, Satan, you know, all that kind of stuff. Satan is this powerful being. But in the Hebrew Bible, Satan works for God. And Satan's job, according to the book of Job, is to go uh, up and down, it says, around the planet, taking note of people who are... Taking, it's like two for hell, okay. So, not, not hell, not hell, but despite the rain outside, your cattle will not grow for bringing them. So, Satan's job is to go back and forth around the, across the earth. They thought the earth was flat. Going back and forth across the earth and reporting on people who are screwing up, but also taking note of people who are not. So, God calls Satan up to testify, and... Uh, God says, have you seen my servant Job? Man, does he love me or what? And then Satan says, of course he loves you. You give him everything. Now, in Deuteronomy, we know it's not that God just willy-nilly, you know, gives something to somebody. Job earned it by being upright. 
and just and, and doing what God wants. It's axiomatic. He did Y, he, he did X, he gets Y. That's just the way it works. We read that in Deuteronomy a minute ago. But in this one, they give it a twist. It's like, so Satan says, look, you give him everything. Of course he loves you. Take it away, and he'll curse you like everyone else. God suffers from low self-esteem in the book of Job. <clears throat> and God basically says, you think so? I, I just thought he loved me. You know, it's like someone who's wealthy and they don't even know if they have actual friends because people are trying to take advantage of them. That's God's problem. He's all powerful, all wealthy, and now he doesn't know if anyone really loves him or not. They just want fat cows. So he wants to know, does Job love me or not? So he tells Satan, no, he empowers Satan. Satan is, not, is doing nothing on his own except, you know, pulling God's low self-esteem button, pushing God's low self-esteem button. So God says, all right, let's test this. The Lord says to the adversary, this is my English translation, the Lord says to Satan, see, all that he has is in your power. I'm giving you control over Job. Only don't lay a hand on him. Just make a miserable but don't harm him personally. So then you get this amazing story. And I'm just going to read it because it's so silly. One day, as his, Job's, one day as Job's sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in the house of their eldest brother, a messenger came to Job and said, the oxen were plowing and the she-asses were grazing alongside them when Sabians attacked and carried them off and put the boys to the sword. I alone have escaped to tell you. You got to... Think of it as a stage play. On, on one stage, a little off stage a little bit, but you can see, Job's kids are having a family outing. Now he's not invited, but he doesn't care. It's just brothers and sisters getting together with their families. Job is in center stage. And then, coming in from off stage, there's this servant. And the first time the servant shows up, oh my God, you won't believe what happened, all your animals were captured by the Sabians, and the servants who were caring for them, they're all dead. So the boys put to the sword, I alone have escaped to tell you. Before Job can even process this, verse 16, this one was still speaking when another one came and said, God's fire fell from heaven, took hold of the sheep and the boys and burned them up. I alone have escaped to tell you. It's a comedy sketch. Here's this guy. And all of a sudden, first guy comes in, you lost all your sheep and, and cattle. You lost all your cattle. And your, the, the herders. Then another guy comes in, says, this big fire fell from heaven, and now your sheep are all gone, and all the shepherds are gone. This one was still speaking when another one shows up. Now, he says, a Chaldean formation of three columns made a raid on the camels and carried them off and put the boys to the sword. The Sabians are after him. Fire is falling from the sky. That's destroying his livelihood. And now the Chaldeans are coming after him. I alone have escaped to tell you. This one was still speaking. I mean, they're all just chattering. And you got to imagine this guy, if it were a play, you have to like see his face. He's like blown away. He can't handle all this. Then, while this one was still speaking, another came and said, your sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in the house of their eldest brother when suddenly a mighty wind came from the wilderness. It struck the four corners of the house so that it collapsed on the young people and they died. I, <clears throat> I alone have escaped to tell you. God empowers Satan to make Job's life miserable. The only thing he's not allowed to do is harm Job physically, so he destroys Job's livelihood and kills Job's kids. The test is, will Job curse God? But Job does not. Job rose, tore his robe, cut off his hair, and threw himself on the ground and worshipped. And he said, naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return, the, return there. 
the Lord is given and the Lord is taken away. Blessed is the name of the Lord. <clears throat> so for all that, for all the destruction of his cattle and his, his sheep and his camels and all the servants, and then his three daughters and his seven sons, for all of that, he says, blessed be the name of the Lord. He didn't sin or cast reproach on God. That's pretty cool that he did that, right? So God should be happy. God should say, see, I told you. He loves me, not what I've given him. Because I just took it all away. So they have another meeting, maybe six months later. And the angels all come together, and Satan is at the other meeting. And Job says, see, I told you. He loves me, not what he had. And then Satan says, the reason he didn't curse you is because you didn't hurt him physically. If you had hurt him physically, he would have cursed you. God, not being strong enough to resist this challenge to his self-esteem, said, really? You think so? All right, well, don't kill him, because then we'll never know, but get close, and let's see what happens. So, the adversary, Satan, and this is verse 2-7, departs from the presence of the Lord and inflicts a severe inflammation on Job from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. Right? He's got some kind of horrible skin disease. One of those things that they advertise for on TV. Right? There's all these creams. Luckily, and, and I don't mean to make light of anyone who's suffering from these things, but luckily I don't have that problem. But I worry about people who do, because I don't know how bad the thing is, but the side effects of the drug always seem worse. <laughs> you get suicidal thoughts, you have all this stuff. I mean, you know, Job is itchy, but all of a sudden he takes this medicine, and I want to kill myself, right? So luckily they didn't have any medicine. All he had was, and you can see it on... Uh, chapter, in chapter 2, verse 8, the only relief he had was to scratch his oozing sores with broken pieces of pottery. He took a pot shirt to scratch himself as he sat in ashes. Then you get one of the best lines in the entire Bible. Job, chapter 2, verse 9, Job's wife says to him, you still keep your integrity? Curse God and die! What is your problem? Just say, God damn it, and you're dead, and all of this is over. You're still not blaming God for this? It, it's really one of the best lines. You ever go to, um, I mean, it could be NASCAR, it could be the Panthers. There's, there's always, is it Panthers or Predators? Predators, yeah. I don't know where the Panthers are. <laughs> predators. Uh, this is, now you know how much I know about sports, right? So you go to a sporting event, and there's always someone in the crowd with a large cardboard sign that says John 3.16 on it. You know, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. There's always that person. And the camera always finds that person, especially if that person is sitting next to a beautiful you know, young woman. They always, they always do that. My suggestion is you make Job 2-9 signs. <laughs> Find the guy with the John 3-16 sign and sit next to him. So when the camera comes over, John 3-16, and then Job 2-9. People watching at home are going to go, oh, John 3-16, yeah, God said love the... Job 2.9, what is that? Get off their Bible. Curse God and die! <laughs> it would just make it more interesting. So, actually, once I talked about that, I forgot what group I was in. They made, I, I was there for a while, they made bumper stickers that said Job 2.9. <laughs> I wasn't putting one on my car. But <laughs> may, maybe they lived in Boston or someplace where you could get away with it. But, all right. So, she says to him, curse God and guy, die. He says to her, you, well, my translation is not so good. It says, you talk as, 
as any shameless woman might talk. So a better translation is, woman, you're speaking foolishly, as opposed to denigrating all women. Uh, so he says, that's foolish. Should we accept only good from God and not evil? And for, and for all that, Job said nothing sinful. But this line, now it's, it's um, 2.10, should we, ignore, should we accept only good from God and not accept evil? In Deuteronomy, the only way you get evil is because you did something wrong. But Job, or the author here, is putting out something different. And this is the old poem, so this is the older material that the poet, the old prose, I mean, that the poet will take and expand. But even in the prose, he's saying, look, God is the source of everything. You can't expect only half. It doesn't work that way. So in, in the, the prophet Isaiah, chapter 45, 7, Isaiah has God say, I create light, I create darkness, I fashion good, I fashion evil, I, the Lord, do all these things. Everything is the doing of God, if you're a true monotheist. Right? Some, some religions have God is only good, and then you have a, a devil character, or uh, God has a, you know, a, a, an equal God against the God of good, who is the God of evil. You know, Zoroastrianism has this war of God of light and God of darkness. A lot of religions have that, or at least echoes of that. But here in even the ancient part of, and Job is old already, but the more ancient part of Job, you have this sophisticated idea that God doesn't provide only good. It's way more sophisticated than Deuteronomy, where God said, you do the right thing, I always reward you. Job was doing the right thing. He is upright. He's sinless. And yet bad things happen to him. So, in, in Larry Kushner's book, um, no, sorry, Harold Kushner's book, when bad things happen to good people, he deliberately avoids the philosophical question, why bad things happen to good people? In the book of Job, there, whoever wrote this is more daring, and he takes on the question, why do bad things happen to good people? And the answer is for the same reason that good things happen to good people, and good things happen to bad people, because stuff happens, and you get it all. You get the good and the bad, that's just the way it works. In the Taoist tradition, they call this, the good and the bad, they call it the 10,000 joys and the 10,000 sorrows of everyday living. And the attitude that the Taoist wants to take is, is one of open-handedness. You just are open to receiving the 10,000 joys and the 10,000 sorrows, there's no way to avoid either. It's, if you're looking for another metaphor, think of a, a magnet. A magnet has to have a positive and negative pole in order to be a magnet. You can't cut off the negative pole and say, ah, I have an only positive magnet, because whatever's on the other end of the, the magnet is now the negative pole. So you can cut the magnet up in smaller and smaller bits, but there's always positive and negative because that's what it is to be a magnet. So the implication of Job, and you can link it to Isaiah 45, 7, the implication of this theology is that good and evil, 10,000 joys, 10,000 sorrows, is what it is to be God. So Job says, look, you have to accept everything. That's just the way it goes. And this is almost the end <coughs> of, of the, before the guy cuts the story and puts in his poem. Then Job has some friends who come, try to comfort him, and that's what the poem is about. But we're going to skip that just to finish the prose. And you go to the end of the book, chapter 42, verse 7. We're back to the original prose. And it says, in the beginning of the prose, he's talking to Job's friend, so we're going we're gonna to skip all that. Uh, but it says in verse um, 
12, says, Thus the Lord blessed the latter years of Job's life more than the former. So there is a quid, I don't know if I say quid pro quo. <clears throat> no, quid pro quo. All right. But because Job never curses God in the prose, at the end of the prose story, God gives him, he did what God wanted, and didn't curse him, so God gives him even more than he had before. So now he gets 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, 1,000 oxen, 1,000 she-asses. And then he gets seven sons and three daughters, and the first he named <coughs> Jemima, who I think is famous for making syrup, but I'm not sure about that. <laughs> Uh, named Jemima, the second Kazia, and the third Karen Hapuach. Uh, nowhere in the land were women as beautiful as Job's daughters to be found. Their father gave them estates together with their brothers. Afterwards, Job lived 140 years to see four generations of sons and grandsons. So Job died old and contented. So it ends on a positive note. You, you don't curse God. You're first set of kids will all be wiped out, but you'll get new kids. And in this case, the first daughters had no names, but in, in, when you get three more daughters, these, these, these girls have names, which is an improvement over the nameless ones. So it, it still sticks pretty close to the original Deuteronomy theology of if you do this, then you will get that. All right, you with me so far? Then this poet gets a hold of it, and he says, I don't buy it. Everyone knows the prose story. This is just a folktale that everyone, it's just common knowledge. So he does this radical thing. I'm saying he, I mean, who knows what it, who, who it is. But the poet does this radical thing, splits the prose in two, and adds 30 chapters of poems. And in the 30 chapters, the poet attacks the Deuteronomy theology. He tries to show you that it, you cannot control God through your actions. You can't be good enough because it's just not the way God works. God works the way Job does, says in 2.10, gives you the whole shebang the good and the bad. It's just the way it is. People don't like that. They want a God who just gives you what they want, the good stuff. And if they see people getting what they don't want, it's because they deserve it. So Job's friends in the poem come to console him, and each one, basically they have the same argument. Each one comes to Job and says, look, this is your fault. Don't blame God. God doesn't do this. God never punishes the good people. God never torments the upright and sinless. God only torments the sinful. And then Job says, but I didn't do anything. So some of his friends said, oh, you know you did, just confess. And Job says, I didn't. And then they say, well, maybe you didn't know, but you should look more closely, and you'll see you did. Because if we... I mean, you have a choice here, in a sense. You can believe God that good people never get punished. Nothing bad happens to them. Or you can believe Job that God is just... You can't put God in the human ethical, theological box of good people get good stuff and bad people get bad stuff. That's, you can't do that to God. That's Job's argument. But his friends are all saying, no, 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 you're wrong. And, and, just imagine, and maybe you hold their belief, right? Maybe you believe that God only rewards the good and only punishes the bad. If that's the case, and, and someone can convince you that is not true, your entire worldview collapses. And that's why his friends cling so tightly to their worldview. Job refuses to confess to something he didn't do. He refuses to say, oh, you're right. I, I'm, I'm, I'm a sinner. 
He refuses to say that. Now, in some rabbinical commentaries, that's enough to be a sinner. Right? That's hubris. <clears throat> that's his sin. He thought he was sinless. That's why God can torture him. I mean, if you want to hold on to the God is good uh, theology, you can twist this any way you want. But the poet who wrote the book of Job doesn't want to defend that theology. The theology that the poet wants to bring is a theology of a God beyond anything that humanity can imagine. A God who does things that we don't understand. A God whose very existence is so outside our capacity to imagine that there's nothing we can do to really understand that God. In the book of Genesis, there's the, the argument between God and Abraham <coughs> about destroying all the people in Sodom. Right? Remember that? So God hears that bad things are happening in Sodom. <coughs> For some reason, most people believe that it's homosexuality that is the problem in Sodom. But the prophets make it very clear. What's the problem in Sodom is when strangers come, they kill them and rob them. That it's inhospitality. That's the sin of Sodom. But anyway, another, another story. God wants to destroy Sodom. And then Abraham says to him, are you nuts? Uh, that's the message Bible version. <laughs> you know, I said, are you nuts? And then he says, should not the judge of all the world do justly? Right? He says to God, you can't destroy the innocent along with the guilty. Shouldn't the, just, the judge of all the world do justly? God's theology at that point is might makes right. I'm God. I can do whatever I want. Abraham is saying to God, no, actually you can't. There is a higher ethical standard than even you know about. I mean, this is one of the most radical passages in the Bible. Abraham is saying, I know better than you do about what's just. God had never been challenged like that before and had no idea what Abraham was talking about. And so Abraham says, look, you can't kill the innocent with the guilty. What if there's 50 innocent people in the place? You can't wipe them all out. So then God thinks about it and says, okay, I'm convinced. If there's 50 people who are nice, I won't destroy the town. Then Abraham says, well, what if there's 40? I mean, just 10 people. Who's going to quibble about 10 people? What if there's only 40 people there? God, okay, all right, so fine, I'll give you 40. And then he goes to 30, then he goes to 20, then he goes down to 10. <coughs> and then he stops pressing his luck. And, he said, and, they, and they agree, if there's 10 good people in Sodom, God won't destroy the, the town. Turns out there weren't, and so the town goes down. We have so many biblical towns in Tennessee, you know, Lebanon and Smyrna. Why don't we have a Sodom? <laughs> I wonder what, Anyway, okay, another, I have no idea why that is. But, so they agree on 10. Now, the rabbinic commentators centuries later take Abraham to task for that. They think Abraham should have argued down to one person, and then Lot could have saved the whole town. But they stop at 10. We don't really know why they stop at 10, but in Jewish culture, Jewish civilization, 10 people, and traditionally 10 men, but 10 people are the minimum number required to actually have a prayer community. So if you're going to have a service, you have to, you know, worship service, you have to have 10, if you're in the Orthodox world, 10 men, if you're in conservative or reform, 10 people uh, in order to form a, a community and, and worship together. So maybe that was true back then, I mean, we don't know, or maybe the notion you have to have 10 comes from the story and we don't know why they stopped at 10. But whatever it is, the point of that verse in Genesis is to say that this person, Abraham, had a higher sense of justice than God. And Abraham taught God what it is to be just. Job is the reverse. Job is saying any, theology, any, any idea of justice that 
we humans can imagine does not apply to God. We cannot expect God to conform to our definition of justice, to our theology. We want a good God who rewards good people. That's just us. We want that. But that's not God. God is something else. So he argues with his friends, never giving in, never confessing to anything. And then finally, <clears throat> God shows up. In, verse, in chapter 38, God shows up in a tempest, in a whirlwind. So this is how I imagine it. God is like a tornado whipping around Job. Right, his friends are outside. And God is just spinning around Job to completely disorient him. That, I mean, that's not what it says. That's how I envision this. Because what happens is completely disorienting. All Job knows, Job knows two things. He's not, he's sinless. And from Job 2.10, God is bigger than our theological imagination. That's really all he knows. So now God shows up, and I, I see him spinning around, disorienting Job. And then God says, Who is this who darkens counsel, speaking without knowledge? Gird your loins like a man, and I will ask, and you will inform me. When I was first learning this when I was a kid, I thought it said lions. I said, gird your lions? What is lions? So, and then God starts, you can't call it a conversation. God peppers Job with, I don't know, you might say unanswerable questions, like, this is 38.4, where were you when I laid the earth's foundation? Speak if you have understanding. Do you know who fixed its dimensions or who measured it with a line? Unto what were its bases sunk? Do you have any idea how the universe is constructed? That you've got some notion about who I am? Look what I've done you haven't got a clue. And it just goes on and on like that. Now the format depends on how you imagine this to be happening. So I look at this from the point of view of a different culture altogether. In Buddhism, both Japanese Zen, Korean Zen, Zen Buddhism, and Tibetan Buddhism, there is a tradition of questioning. In rabbinic Judaism, there's a tradition of questioning. When the rabbis question Jesus, we tend to think it's an attack on Jesus. But in fact, it's what rabbis do with one another. It's an honoring of Jesus by saying, Rabbi, what's the best, you know, what are the, what, what's the most important commandment? They ask that of themselves all the time. And there's all these texts where the different rabbis respond. So this was just an honoring of, of Jesus as a fellow rabbi asking him these questions. So in rabbinic Judaism, which of course comes much later than this, there is this, um, this tradition where questions are honoring the person being questioned. In Tibetan Buddhism and in Zen Buddhism, the, the master, the spiritual master, uses questions to push the, the student beyond what the student is comfortable with. And the way they do it in, in Tibet, it's sort of interesting, I think. Um, the master will come really close to your face and stand right in front of you and ask you, you know, where were you when I built the foundations of the earth? In, in Zen, the, the equivalent question is, show me your face before you were born. You know, where were you before you were you? And in Tibet, they go right up to your head and they smack their hands. The teacher will smack his two hands together and get his hand right near your face. Never touches you, but it's like shocking. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? The idea is to shock you out of your normal discursive mind, your rational mind, with the assumption that if you could just get out of your egoic box, your rational mind, you'll have an answer, but not a rational answer. You'll know what God is, in this case, 
what God is trying to show you, but you won't know it in a logical way. So that's how I look at this. I think these questions are not negative. It's God trying to help Job move beyond his... Because even though he's attacking the if-then theology of Deuteronomy that his friends are promoting, even though he's attacking it, he's still clinging to his own idea. And his own idea that God gives good and bad is pointing in the right direction, but God wants to say even that isn't broad enough. I am way beyond any concept of good and bad. So he starts out, and we're not going to read all these questions. It just goes on you know, indefinitely here, almost. But it's just, it just, just God questioning and questioning and questioning. So just uh, 38, 16, if you penetrated the sources of the sea, you know, gone all the way down, or walked on the recesses of the deep, have, you, have the gates of death been disclosed to you? Right? We were just talking about that. Right? We don't know. Um, have, you, have, you, uh, have you seen the gates of the deep darkness? Have you surveyed the expanses of the earth? If you know of these, tell me. But you can't because you don't. So you're forced into a stunned silence. Now, if you've never experienced this, it's hard to grasp. But I, and, and again, this is now from a different tradition. So in the, I have a, a Hindu teacher. His name is Prasanna. And he is of a lineage um, where you ask these questions um, to try to get you out of your egoic box. And a couple of years ago, I was with him sitting in his living room and we're just chatting, because that's what he does, just talking. And then, out of nowhere, he asks me uh, the question, are you? And it doesn't make sense, are you? But it was in the midst of this conversation with him, and he asked it in such a way that I could not respond. Not only did I not have an answer, I was no longer present to answer the question. He had knocked me out of my egoic box. I couldn't say yes, I couldn't say no. It was just silence. No thought in my head. When, a few seconds later, you, I come back to my normal state, almost, I realize that there's been a question. And now I'm, I have a thought. And the thought is, I have absolutely nothing to say. I, and, and I live to talk, right? So there was nothing coming out. There was nothing to say. I don't know what I experienced, but I experienced some expanse that my regular mind could not handle. Which is the point. That was what he's trying to say. And, and his theology is, you are not this limited egoic being. You are that, this infinite expanse. In, in Hinduism, it's called tatvam asi. You are the divine. The way a wave is the ocean. You're part of this entire thing. If you can get out of your wave limitation, you realize the ocean, but you can't say anything. That's what I think God is doing to Job here. He's pushing Job's buttons in order to free Job from his limited way of thinking. This is not the same God of the prose poem. The God who's like all whiny, like, oh, you think he doesn't love me? He only likes me because I give him stuff. Let's torture him. This is a much more sophisticated God, and, which is the poet's idea. This is what the poet thinks is true. And I happen to incline in this direction, so you, you should know that. So he's, God is pushing Job, and the poet is pushing the reader, hopefully beyond the box of our everyday consciousness. So it just goes on. At one point, Job tries to stop what's going on. And Job says, this is chapter 40, and Job says, see, I'm of small worth. How can I possibly answer you? I'm nobody. So I clap my hand to my mouth. You know, he's like, that's it, I'm not talking. I clap my hand to my mouth. I have spoken once and will not reply twice, but I'm not going to do it again. 
right? I spoke, I, I said something, I'm not gonna say anything else. Okay, okay, I said two things, but I'm not gonna go with a third. And the idea here is please stop this. Job is coming very close to the experience God wants Job to have. The experience God wants Job to have is to take his idea in 2.9 that everything comes from God, the good and the bad, and get it out of an idea, out of a theological perspective that you thought of, and experience it as a felt reality. In, two, in 2.10, not 2.9, in 2.10, Job spouts this theology, we get the good and the bad from God. By the end of the book, what God is hoping for, well, and it happens, by the end of the book, what God wants is for Job to realize the truth of that beyond intellectual speculation. You follow that? He wants him to have some kind of felt experience. But Job doesn't want that. My, my read on this is he's getting close. Job is moving close, and it's scaring him. Because to have the experience God wants him to have, Job has to stop being Job. Right? The ego has to, has to die for a moment. And that's scary. It's not something that people necessarily want. And Job is being pushed into that. And he realizes, no, 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 this has got to stop. I'm too scared to let this happen. So he says, okay, I won't say anything. I won't say anything. Let's, you know, let's change the subject. Let's, how, how about we go out for lunch, right? God ignores him. In 40, verse 6, God says, or the, the um, poet says, Then the Lord replied to Job out of the tempest. Let's start all over again. You can't escape this. If you really want to know what's going on, there is, once you start the process, you can't escape. Gird your lions like a man. No, that's not what I said. <laughs> Gird your loins like a man. I will ask, and you will inform me. But of course, Job can't inform God because this is nothing that people can grasp. Would you impugn my justice? Abraham did, but not in this story. Would you condemn me that you might be right? And so don't, it's not just condemn, because his friends maybe have that notion that something's wrong with God, but Job doesn't. Job doesn't condemn God. Job knows that good and bad come from God. He just wants God to fit his intellectual idea. So condemn is probably the wrong word. Maybe misunderstand that you might be right. Are, have you an arm like God's? I mean, that's a famous gospel song. Can you thunder with a voice like his? Deck yourself now with grandeur and eminence. Clothe yourself in glory and majesty. Scatter wide your raging anger. See every proud man and bring him low. See every proud man and humble him and bring them down where they stand. Bury them. I mean, this is, you know, Job can't do any of this stuff. So he's just pushing him further and further. In chapter 42, and this is where it's the most misunderstood text. In chapter 42, Job finally says something. And not like, please shut up, I'm sorry. He says, he says something. So I'm going to read you uh, in the standard uh, translation. It's got to be something similar to yours. But then I'm going to challenge what it, what it says. Job says to God, I know you can do everything. Nothing you propose is impossible for you. Who is this who obscures counsel without knowledge? Speaking of himself. Indeed, I spoke without understanding of things beyond me, which I did not know. Hear now, and I will speak. This is, he's quoting God. Uh, I will ask, and you will inform me. Well, I heard you with my ears, but now I see you with my eyes. Therefore, I recant and relent, being but dust and ash. So some translations, I despise myself and cover myself in dust and ash. Is that, yeah? So we're going to take issue with that last verse. But let's just look at the thing before. Verse 5, I had heard you with my ears. Now, he's not talking about, I heard what you've been asking me, all these questions. I heard about you from my teachers, from other people, from my friends. I, I, in my own imagination, I heard about you. I had this idea. But now, 
I see you with my eyes. Now, he doesn't actually see God. God is spinning around in this whirlwind. He doesn't see anything. Right? Job doesn't see anything. He's not talking about his physical eyes or, or, or maybe even his physical ears in a sense. What he's saying is, I had an idea. Now I've had an experience. And the Hebrew actually makes eyes singular. The actual text says, but now I see you with my eye. And the rabbis make a big deal about this, that it's not the eyes in his head, it's the eye of his soul. He sees on a much deeper level. Meaning he now has experienced what God wants him to experience. And the experience is ineffable, like the four-letter name of God is unpronounceable. In it. The experience is ineffable because it's just beyond human imagining. That's what God wants. Can you drop your theology? Even if it's pretty close, like God is both good and bad, like Isaiah 45, 7, or Job 2, 10. He says, can you drop the whole thing? If you can, you'll see with your eye, you'll see with a different sense, you'll have this experience, and you will know what's true. For some reason, and this, according to scholars, and I have to defer to, to people who know way more than I do, so looking at the Greek translation of the Bible, it's this notion that uh, I, I despise myself and all of that comes from the Greek. But the scholars say, that this is a misunderstanding of the Hebrew. So without driving you nuts, I'm just going to read from, this is the book of Job, Stephen Mitchell's translation. So Stephen Mitchell is this amazing poet. Uh, he translates from Hebrew and Chinese. He knows Hebrew, Chinese, he has help with that. But <clears throat> He's talking, I'm not going to belabor all the Hebrew, it gets confusing, but what he says is that the word that we're describing as uh, recant and relent or despise myself, he says it means to be comforted about, maybe to repent of, but never to repent in. In other words, Job isn't repenting, like, oh, I'm so sorry, and I'm in mourning, I'm going to cover myself in dust and ash. What Stephen says, the Hebrew says, is, and I've checked it other places, I mean, he's not wrong. What the Hebrew says is, I am comforted. Now, how would you read that? So, here's what, how Mitchell closes the, the text. I'm going to read the whole poem here in 42 again. I know you can do all things and nothing you wish is impossible. Who is this, why, this, who is this whose ignorant words cover my design with darkness? Right? That's Job quoting God again. I have spoken of the unspeakable and tried to grasp the infinite. Right? With his intellect, you can't do that. God says, listen and I will speak, I will question you, please instruct me. So God is saying, I'm going to take you beyond your intellect. And then here's the last line. I had heard of you with my ears, now my eyes, he still uses the plural, my eyes have seen you, therefore I will be quiet, comforted that I am dust. In other words, and, and he's got a whole list of places where dust and ash doesn't mean actual dust and ash on the ground. It's a way of referring to the human body as being mortal. I am comforted in the fact that I am just this blip on the divine radar. I am comforted by the fact that I am uh, I'm mortal, that I'm impermanent. I'm comforted by the fact that I'm not in control of the universe. When I realize, Job is saying, when I realize that you're doing all of this, including me, that is comforting. It's the wave taking comfort in being the ocean. As the wave moves closer to the shore, I mean, you can imagine the waves discussing this. As they get closer to the shore, they go, oh, look, where'd Fred go? <laughs> Where's Miriam? She was there a minute ago. And then they start having this debate. Is there life after beach, you know? 
but what they don't realize is they're the ocean. When they hit the shore, they don't go anywhere. They simply return to what they were before they were the wave. Show me your face before you were born in the Zen world. Or all these questions from God. Do you know your truest nature as a manifesting of God? If you do, then the 10,000 joys and the 10,000 sorrows that happen to the, the embodied person are all from God, and you can take comfort in the fact that this is just the way the world is. You're not being punished. You're not being rewarded. My kids didn't do anything wrong. My shepherds didn't do anything wrong. It's simply the nature of reality, and I have to accept the nature of reality as it is. And though it may pain me, I don't curse God because it's like, why? It makes no sense. This is simply the way reality is. That's why the book of Job is a direct assault on Deuteronomy. If you do the right thing, God gives you the big prize. And it is an incredibly sophisticated theology about, as good in the 21st century as it was back then, an incredibly sophisticated theology about the nature of reality and God's manifesting of reality. I read the book and I find great comfort in it. I think Job is the most important book of the Bible, uh, along with Song of Songs, so you don't lose sex. But <laughs> I think Job is the most honest book. It's one of the most important books in the Bible because it gives me comfort where Deuteronomy does not. I think I've outgrown Deuteronomy. I know good people for whom bad things happen. What Job says is, of course you do, because bad things happen to everybody. But do you know that it's all part of this amazing, dynamic unfolding of the divine? If you don't, you needlessly suffer. If you do, you can find comfort in just being a part of that unfolding. So that is my take on Job. We have a couple of minutes left. Anybody have a burning question about this? Yeah. You like the idea that good things can... Oh, yeah, right. But, yeah, the, the injustice that we perceive, but it's not, according to Job, it's not, our notion of just and unjust are irrelevant. Yeah, are irrelevant. That's why, that's why I, like, I like the book. Anybody else want to jump in? Yeah. Yeah, so the question, if God knew, knows everything that's going to happen, why do anything? So, yeah, why, are we in, why do we exist? Right? If you believe that God is omniscient and God knows everything from the Big Bang to the end, then God is the most bored <laughs> mind in the universe because everything is a rerun. What's God going to, oh yeah, I know what you're going to do. Eh, all right, fine, who cares? So, so it, it doesn't fit that. I mean, there are multiple theologies. The one that God knows everything probably doesn't fit with the, the notion here in Job. In the Bible, God never seems to know what's going on. You know, it's like, what? They did what? I smashed them, right? So, so it's different, it's different theologies. Anybody else want to jump in? Well, no, right, there is no answer to, to that. In the context of Job, there's no question why. Job never even asked that question. The question that I was responding to, if God knows everything in advance, why actually do it, right? I mean, have you ever tried to write a mystery novel? I've written 36 books. I've never written a mystery novel. I always wanted to write a mystery novel. We have this great mystery novel convention here in Nashville every year. And I've been, and I listen to these authors, and I'm so enthralled with what they do. And every time I sit down to write a mystery novel, I know how it turns out, and I'm too bored to write the book. <laughs> so if God knows how it's going to turn out, why bother actually doing it? <laughs> All right, I have to let you go. Thank you very much for coming out in the rain.